third service, man, I love you guys. Always such an honor to get a worship with you. I told Brad, Brad, Brad that uh, you guys were going to be awesome, man, which you were. So it's always cool to get a worship with you guys. I want to let you know, man, it's uh, 15 days till Christmas. So some of you men out there, you might want to start thinking about that. I know you're I know you're kind of out there thinking, I bet my wife would use a new gun for Christmas or something like that, but I'm going to change your thinking, all right? So anyway, let you know that. And uh, this year, I mentioned this last week, but Christmas Eve is on Sunday this year. So uh, here at Pauline, we're going to do five services on Sunday. They're all going to be identical. We're going to start at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10, 11, 30, 2, 3, 30, and 5. So there'll be Christmas Eve and Sunday all rolled into one. And they're all going to be here in our main, main sanctuary. So if you'd like to uh, get a spot in one of those particular services, you can actually go online and go ahead and reserve a couple of spots under your name. And it's first come, first serve. So if you've got a particular one of those services you'd like to go to, uh, you go ahead and do that now. That would help us. It's kind of help us kind of decide, control who's going to be where so we can make sure everybody has a seat when they do arrive. So that's going on. We've also got a disaster relief training on January 6th. If you'd like to help with our mobile global, taking it to places like we did with Harvey or Southern Springs, you can, you can do that. There's a piece of paper at our connection, show you how to sign up and uh, go through the training you have to have to uh, be a part of that. Well, it's good to be here, man. If you've got your Bible, open it up to Judges chapter 6. We're in the series Advent. Today we're talking about love. Uh, and I want to look at a passage of scripture that's actually Old Testament, Judges chapter 6. The word love in the New Testament, agape, is the Greek word. It's, it's this idea of this unconditional undeserved act of God where he gives his love to us even though we do not deserve it. This is the idea of agape love. It's a word that classical Greek didn't even have. They basically had to come up with a word to describe what it is that God did for us through his son Jesus. This this lavish act of love that God did for us through Jesus was so outside the, the Greek language. They literally came up with this word to help us describe it. And, and basically at the root of this word, it, it means that the person doing the, the giving or the person doing the loving gives what the recipient, not what they want, okay? Not like God's a Santa Claus or something, but he gives us what we need the most. This is the idea of agape love, that God doesn't give us what we want, but what we need the most. And when we talk about the love of God, you know, uh, God doesn't change. It says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the way that he acted towards people in the Old Testament in love is the same reflection of the way that he acts towards us in the New Testament. So I want to look at this passage to get today as an example, and it's about a guy named Gideon. And uh, what I like about this particular story is that when God looks at Gideon, he doesn't see him as he is but he rather he sees him as he can be with God's help. And this is what God does for us. He helps God to see us. God doesn't see us just as we are, but as we can be with his help. Now that's important to us because, you know, sometimes God looks at us and what he would see is not that good. But with the help of Jesus Christ, we can be different and God sees us that way. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. This Judges chapter six. I'm gonna begin in verse 11, all right? So Judges 6, verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak, under the oak. Now, anytime you see the phrase angel of the Lord and it has a definite article in it, the angel of the Lord, then there's a good chance it's not talking about just an angel, but, you know, it might've been God himself, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ showing up in human form. And I'll show you why they believe that here in a minute. But it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joaz the Abzerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, the context of this, uh, Gideon is an Israelite, and they're being oppressed by a group of people that are known as the Midianites, all right? And the reason they are being oppressed is given to us at the beginning of this passage, Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, they had turned away from following God like they should. They weren't living like they should according to the covenant promises that God had given them in the Old Testament. And so they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he, the Lord, gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So the Israel you know, was not living like they should. And so God allowed them to be, you know, given over into the hands of the Midianites. The Midianites were a group of people. And basically what they would do is, is once a year, 
right after harvest time, they would roll into Israel and they would basically plunder Israel. They had a military advantage that Israel didn't have. And what that was is they had camels, all right? And that enabled, that was like, kind of like, you know, the enemy having a Humvee and a couple of Toyota pickups and you having nothing. And so because of this advantage, they would come in and would basically in, in mass would come in and just plunder your stuff. They would come to your house and take all your crops and your sheep and, and whatever you might have of any value, they would just take it from you. It was like ISIS coming in and just conquering the land and taking all your stuff. And then they would leave and they would go live off your stuff for a year. And then the following year, about the harvest time, they would come back in there and do the same thing. Mean, meanwhile, you had nothing to eat and no way to survive. So, uh, you know, the Midianites were oppressing the nation of Israel. And it says that Gideon was threshing out wheat in a wine press. Now, it's kind of interesting because the way people would thresh out wheat is you would have what was called a threshing floor. And usually it was up on top of a high hill where the wind was blowing good and you would take all your harvested wheat and you would put it in a big pile in the middle of the threshing floor and then you would, you would thresh it. You would have animals walk across it or you might drag a threshing sled, a sled across it, which was a big wooden sled that would kind of knock the grain out of the head. And then you would go up there with a pitchfork and you would throw it up in the air and the wind would come along and blow away the chaff and the straw and the wheat would drop back down on the ground. And after a while, you would harvest your wheat that way. Thresh your wheat out on the thing. But, but, but Gideon wasn't doing it up on top of a hill. He was doing it in a wine press. And the reason was because he was down in a hole doing it because he didn't want the Midianites to see him. I'm not going to go up on the hill and do it because if the Midianites see me doing it, they'll come and, and take my wheat. So he's doing it down in a wine press because of fear of the Midianites. And when God shows up, he says to Gideon, you know, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Reality was Gideon was anything but a mighty warrior. You know, he was a scaredy cat. He was down in the wine, in the wine press, pressing out his wheat, you know, trying to thresh his wheat so that, that they might not see him. But, but God doesn't call him what he was. God calls him what he might be. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, why does God call him a mighty warrior? And I believe the reason is, is because Exodus chapter 15, verse 3 says that the Lord is a mighty warrior. That God himself is a, a warrior. And basically, God's going to come along and say, I'm going to join in with you that together we might conquer the Midianites. Come on and let's do this mighty warrior. And here's how Gideon responds, verse 13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when he said, did not the Lord bring you up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Verse 14, and the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. And am, I, am I not sending you? And when, when the Lord sends someone, he empowers them to accomplish it. Am I not sending you? But, but Lord, Gideon asked, verse 15, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you. I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites together or literally as one man. Now, here's the reason I like this particular passage of scripture so much is because a lot of times I can relate to Gideon. Sometimes I look in my life and I want to say, man, the Midianites are oppressing me. The things around me, the situation I'm in, the circumstances that I find myself in are oppressing me, man. And, and I need some help in my life. Where, where's the Lord in this right here? Right? If the Lord is with me, why is this going on in my life? I, I've got conflict here or difficulties here or health issues or financial issues or whatever's going on. And sometimes I'm like, I'm like Gideon, I want to say, man, God, if you're in this, why, why is this going on? Why is this going on in my life? So the real question that I want to ask is, why did the Lord show up? What caused the Lord himself to come down and sit down and have a conversation with Gideon and say, I'm going to help you. You know, what, what is it that, that Gideon did? What, why did God show up and help Gideon? And, and the answer to that question is this, is God did it out of love. God did it as an act of love towards Gideon. He did it out of love. Now, the, the word for love in the Old Testament is a different word. Hesed 
is the transliteration of it, hesed love. It just translated loving kindness. You see this all the time in Scripture, the loving kindness of God, the unfailing love of God, the steadfast love, the loyal love, the mercy of God. The basic idea behind it is just an act of kindness, love or mercy towards someone. So in Exodus chapter 19 or 15, rather, verse 13, you see Moses, when he comes out of the Red Sea, he sings this song to the Lord. It's one of the most ancient songs recorded for us in the Bible. And Moses singing unto the Lord says this, in your un- unfailing love, your hesed love, you, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. It's this idea of this covenant love of God, this love that God has promised towards Israel, the faithful love promised within a covenant. And God was in a covenant with, you know, with Israel. He'd made a promise to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you, God had said. In Exodus 19, when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, out of bondage, God spoke to them and said, now, if you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Why would God do that? Just as an act of love. This, this Old Testament love is, is a love that is willing to commit itself to another by formal promise. The idea behind it, it's, it's, who God, it's part of God's character. It's just who God is. God is love. So I've got a commentary by a guy named Dale Davis. He puts this, in God's eyes, Hesed love that truly loves is a love that is willing to bind itself is willing to promise, willingly and gladly obligates itself so that the other may stand securely in that love. That God actually binds himself by promise to another people so he becomes obligated to that person to treat them in a certain way. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Now, my wife and I were talking about this some time ago and uh, we were talking about it because I had a marriage coming up and I was like, man, this, is, this type of love is the very kind of love that we need in our marriages, you know, this this Hesed type of love. And, and she said this to me. She said, when, when you truly know, rely on, and trust in the love that God has for you, that will allow you to love others freely, regardless of how they love you back or if you get anything in return. And that's really important in a marriage because there might be a lot of times you are not being loved the way you ought to be. And on that day, it's this kind of love that will carry you through It's a love that goes beyond human love. It's a love that's hard for us to understand because human love, the love that we most often think about when we think about love, is usually conditional love. It's based upon what the person does for us. We say, well, I really love that person because they're pretty, or I love that person because of the way they make me feel, or or, I love that person because of what they say, and I like like to be around them, right? It's based upon what they do. What have you done for me Lately, if you treat me right, I love you, but if not, then I fall out of love with you. I just don't feel like I I love you anymore. It's based on our emotions and our feelings, not based on a commitment towards love towards one another, right? But this Hesed love, it, it just gives. It's an unconditional love. It's an undeserving love. It's an unmerited love. It's an unlimited love. Just God just loves us whether we deserve it or not. Unconditional. This is what you see in Gideon. Here's Gideon. They're being oppressed by the Midianites because they've done evil in the sight of the Lord. They did not deserve for God to show up, but he showed up anyway. Why did God show up? Because he had made a promise to the nation of Israel, and he was keeping his promise even though they were unfaithful. God makes promises to us, and he's going to be faithful to us because because this is what love does. It just gives unconditionally, unmarried. God says, you know, hey, nation of Israel's in trouble, I'm going to show down and help them, even if it's their own fault. So he comes down and speaks to Gideon. Oh, the Lord is with you, almighty oh, warrior. With the Lord's with me. Why is all this going on? And God gives him an invitation. He said, I'm going to send you and I'll be with you. He invites, you know, he, this is the invitation. I'll be with you and I'll help you. Okay. This is the invitation he makes to Gideon. I'll be with you and I will help you. I want to be in a relationship with you if you're willing to do it. This is the same exact opportunity that God gives to us. He gives us an opportunity. So this is, this is the way love works. All right. Love is always based upon a choice. True love requires a choice for you to give love requires a choice on your part, 
but the recipient has to choose it as well. And if the recipient chooses it, then it makes the love more fuller and complete. Without the acceptance, it's not what it could be. So for instance, you think about uh, God creating Adam and Eve and putting him in the garden. Here's Adam and Eve. He puts him in the garden, perfect environment, perfect relationship. Everything's perfect. He's like, man, just live it up. Do whatever you want to do. I created all this because I love you. Just go enjoy life. But he gives them a choice. But that one tree in the garden, in the middle of the garden, of, of, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, just don't eat from it. He gives them a choice. Now, when you look at the Garden of Eden, you know what's going to happen. They're going to eat of that tree and sin's going to enter in and just wreck the whole thing. Everything's wrecked because of their decision to make a poor choice. So naturally, we look at that and we say, we'd have been a lot better off if God hadn't given them a choice. We'd have been better off. God could have just created a robot, stuck them in the garden, do whatever you want. Just don't eat off of that one tree. We'd have been a lot better. Why did God put that tree in there? Why did God give them a choice? And the answer to that is because we are created in the image of God. We have the capacity to love. But love is always based on a choice. So he gave them the opportunity, you see, to choose to actually love him back. It's a choice. We understand this. Like, you think about marriage. God originated marriage. You know, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, quotes that exact same verse. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, he says. But I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. He's talking about this. In other words, in our culture in America, and I know this isn't every situation, but just in our culture, this is the way it normally works. You have a young man, and he meets a girl, and they begin to date. And, a court, and you know, over time, they fall in love. So at some point, this, this, this young man makes a decision to propose to this girl, which I know there's some of you young men out there, you need to get on with it. All right. Just quit kidding around. You're never going to be better than that particular girl you're dating. So anyway, uh, you know, they, they say, Hey, I'm going to propose to this girl and ask her to marry me. Now that's a choice they make. They're making a choice to, to, to give their love away to this girl. It's a choice they make. When God chose to love you, that was his choice. God chose to love you. He chose to give his son. This is God making a choice. This person makes a choice. I'm going to ask this person to marry me. They go to the girl and that person, hey, I love you. Would you marry me? Now, now when, when he says that to her, she has a choice. I mean, she can say, no, I don't think so. You know, we're not compatible, uh, whatever. I don't think the time's right. She could say no. If she says no, he's expressed love to her. But that's all she's going to get is that initial expression of love because she's not going to get any more. But if she says yes, if she responds and say, yes, I want that, then he now has the opportunity to give a full expression of his love. They're going to be able to spend more time together. They can spend their life together. He can provide for her and love her and show her by his actions how much he really loves her and what it'll do. They'll have the opportunity to deepen their relationship through that love as they love one another. It's more than just the initial offering of love. It's when you accept that love, the combination thereof results in a greater love, a greater love for you. This is what you see in Gideon. God comes down and says, hey, I'll be with you if you want me to. And you see by faith, Gideon respond to that. All right. He begins to respond to that and he comes to know God in a greater way because of his response to God. So you think about God, two things about God. Number one, God is good. God, God has good things for you. He loves you. He desires good things for you. And so out of that love, he doesn't give you what you want. It's not like he's Santa Claus. He gives you what you need the most. This is what God does for you. He gives you what you need the most. But in that giving you what you need the most, he makes a promise to you. This is this is Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We know that God works all things together for good. Why? Because God loves you. He wants what's best for you. So he's taking every situation in your life and he's working it together for good. He's going to bring something good, even if it doesn't feel good right now. Even if what you're going through is hard. Even if it's difficult, God's made a promise to you. In fact, he's obligated himself to you, believer. He said, I'm going to take everything going on in your life, and I'm going to bring it together for good. 
I'm going to do it. I'm obligated. God obligates himself to you through that promise, right? He's obligated to, to work things out in your life for good because he said that he would. Now, that doesn't mean everything in your life is going to feel good at that particular time. It just means at the end of the day, you're going to be able to look back and go, man, God was working in that even when I couldn't see it, okay? Now, my wife got invited to a cookie party the other day. It's like, she was going to make these cookies. She went to this cookie party, and in exchange, she was going to exchange a bunch of cookies and bring those home. I, as soon as she told me that, I said, this sounds like a good deal for me, <laughs> right? I like cookies, man. I get all different kinds of cookies. So... She was making these cookies the other day. You know, you make cookies. Take flour, take salt, you take sugar, you take baking powder, you take vanilla, whatever. You got to take lard or butter. You pick it up. Any of those ingredients in and of themselves really don't taste that good. Like if you get in a hurry, take a, you know, scoop of flour. Mm. Like vanilla. Like I love the way vanilla smells. I got this big quart jar of vanilla. Like, you know, I got it in Juarez back in the day. And it smells so awesome. It's like, this stuff is great, you know? And so one day I decided I'll make me a vanilla Coke out of it, all right? <laughs> vanilla Coke out of it because it smells so good. You know, van apparently vanilla is like 95% alcohol, all right? <laughs> I mean, a big, I'm just like, this tastes terrible, but I feel better about life right now. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know? It's like any of those ingredients, just in and of themselves, like you get a big scoop of butter, like this is so good, but just, I don't know, you know, but, but when you take all that and individually, not so bueno, but you put them together, what do you get, man? You get something that tastes delicious, right? You get something good out of that. And this is the way life is sometimes. If you love God, if you trust him, if you're pressing in on him, God is good, and he has a way of working everything together in your life for good when you follow him. And not only is God good, God is love. This is just who he is. 1 John 4, God is love, and love freely gives. This is what love does. It just gives. Man, it just unconditionally gives, unmerited. It doesn't matter who you are. God's just giving this love to you. He sent his son to die for you. But at the same time, love always requires a response because God never forces his love upon anyone. Therefore, when God's love is offered to you, guess what? You can miss it. No, I couldn't ever miss God's love. I said, yeah, you could. I'll, I'll give you an example. In Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10, New Testament example, a guy comes to Jesus one day. This guy's young, educated, smart, millennial. He comes to Jesus. He has one question. Here's his question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a great question, man. I mean, if you could ask Jesus one question, would this not be the kind of question you would want to ask Jesus? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He comes up, throws himself at the feet of Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to his question. You know, he says, that's a good question. Why do you call me good? Are you seeing in me something? You know, but then he says, hey, you know the commandments, and he gives them the last six commandments, all that do with his relationship with other people. You know, uh, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, honor your father and your mother. And this guy says, this is in Mark chapter 10, verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. Oh, I like that answer, Jesus. I do all that stuff. I've been doing that stuff since I was a kid, man. I, it's been a while since I murdered anybody and, and uh, haven't committed adultery, you know. And, and man, my parents are, are giving me an allowance every month. Why would I want to dishonor them? And I've been honoring my, I've done all that stuff. You know, I mean, we all have a higher, ex, you know, a higher view of ourselves and it's really true. Uh, I, I've done all that stuff. And then it says in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. That word look means to see everything about him, man. Jesus looked at this guy and all the stuff that's going on in his life, man. And he loved him unconditionally, undeserved, unmerited. He looked at that guy the same exact way he looks at you. He loves you. Just like he loved a Samaritan woman. Just like he loved a Gerizim demoniac. Just like he loved a leper. It's like, like he loved the tax collector, loved the Pharisee. He loves you, man. This is God is love. He loves you. He looked at this guy and he, 
and he loved him. And then he, he, he turned around, and, and so he responded to his question, okay, you know what you'd really like maybe would be a pat answer for me just to say, hey, everything's going to be fine, man. But you know what? Everything's not going to be fine. So he looked at him. He loved him. He didn't give him what that guy wanted. He gave that guy what he needed the most. Okay, Jesus says, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. Okay, you want to know the truth? I love you, man. I'm going to tell you the truth. You need to sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Give it away. And come follow me. Now, in, in Mark chapter 12, Jesus is approached by another man, a teacher of the law, and he's asked a question. And the question is this, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the one thing in life I've got to do, man? What's the greatest possible of all the commandments out there? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds to him. You know, this is recorded for us in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second one is like it. Love the neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. The most important thing you can do in life, Jesus says, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God, number one, more important with everything you got. You just need to love God. God. Now, if that's the greatest commandment, by logic, you kind of must think that the greatest sin would not to be not to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this particular guy that asked Jesus this question had a problem. You know what his problem was? He loved his money more than he loved God. He loved his money more than he loved God. And so God said, if you really want to have eternal life, you know what you need to do? You need to get rid of your money. You need, to, you need to give it away. You need to sell everything you have and you come follow me. I'm God. You come follow me and then you'll have eternal life. God gave him an invitation. You really want to have it? I love you, man. I'm going to tell you the truth. Sell everything you have and come follow me. He gave him an invitation. Watch this. But this, verse 22, but at this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, that God gave him his love, but he didn't accept it. Okay? He didn't accept it. So he didn't experience all that God had for him because God had more for him. Look, the most famous passage on love in the Bible says the very exact same thing. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the world unconditional, undeserved, every person unlimited. For God so loved the world, every person that's ever lived. For God so loved, he gave his only son, his one and only son, his one unique son. God gave his only son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only, what an act of unbelievable love, man. This is the this is a definition of love right here. God is love because he gave us his son unconditionally, unmerited, unlimited. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, second half of the verse. So whosoever, for whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, he, gave, he gives his love. That's only half of it. You're not going to get the full extent of God's love unless you accept it and embrace it and come to know him through relationship in it. Right? For God gives it, to, gives it to you, but it doesn't do any good unless you accept it. John 1, 11, He, Jesus, came to that which was his own, the Jewish people, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, trusted in him, chose to follow him, he gave the right to become children of God. More than we could ever imagine. You know, he loves us, but when we respond to that love, he gives us a deeper relationship. Uh, when someone loves them, it's always an invitation into a, a deeper relationship. So you're like, oh, how do I respond? What would be an appropriate response to what God is, how God has loved me? What would be the appropriate response? And the only answer to that is you've got to love him back. I got to love him back. I got to love him back in the same way, unconditionally unlimited. I love him back. So, you know, this question is asked, you know, how, how do you love God? It's, you know, number one, 
Do you keep his commandments? John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will obey my commandments. It says in 1 John 5, 3, this is love for God to obey his commandments. And because when you do what Jesus wants you to do, he has a way of doing the impossible through your life and you come to know him in relationship and by experience in a whole new way you never could have otherwise. Not only is just obeying his commandments the best thing you can possibly do, but it puts you in a position to know him in a greater way because you reciprocate the love that he gives to you. So you think about Gideon, God shows up, says, man, you're in trouble, bro. I'm here to help you. Gideon says, I'll do it. You read the rest of the story. He begins to do whatever God asked him to do. He gets down to one point, 135,000 Midianites. He's got 32,000 troops. And God says to him, chapter 7 of Judges, bro, you got too many troops. I don't know what I mean. I only got 32,000. I got 135,000. I don't like the way you do math. And God says, you got too many. If you defeat them with that 32,000, you'll take credit for it. So I tell you what, Gideon, anybody that's afraid, just tell them to go to the house. You know what Gideon's thinking? Bro, they're all afraid. If I say that, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, in other words, would you do that? Would you be like, wait a minute, God, I thought you just said if they were afraid, send them home. But obviously that must not be from you because that doesn't make any sense. So I must have missed out what you were trying to say. I thought that's what you said, but you must not said that because that don't make any sense. So I'm not going to do that. That's not what he says. He says, okay. If you're afraid, go to the house. 22,000 of them left. Now he's got down. He's got 10,000 left. What's God say now? Oh, man, he's still got too many, bro. Really? Yeah. If they drink a certain way, you know what he gets down to? 300. And now God says, okay, that's a good number. Let's go take him on with that 300. <laughs> God, I thought you said I should take him on with just 300 and some jars and a burning torch. I'm not sure. Now, he goes out there, I mean, you know the story. He defeats 135,000 of them with 300 men. Who came to know God better on that day? Which one of those people would you rather be? Gideon, who God worked in your life as a mighty warrior to defeat 135,000 men with 300? Or would you rather be the rich young ruler who walked away sad? You know, Paul always referred to himself as a, a do loss, slave of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 on slave of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, there's a verse that says, if you buy a Hebrew slave, he can only serve you for six years. In the seventh year, he has to go free. Every seventh year, if you've got a Hebrew slave, you have to allow him to go free according to Old Testament law. There's a provision in there. But if he loves you, but if he loves his master and does not want to leave, Exodus 21 you can take him and he can publicly proclaim that and you take an awl and make a hole in his ear on the doorpost and then he'll be your slave forever. Bond, servant, do loss. Think of all the great things Paul saw, did, experienced, that relationship he had with Jesus it came from one thing. Whatever you want me to do, Jesus, that's what I'm going to do. I just do whatever you want me to do. I just do whatever you want me to do. If you really, how do you respond to the love of God? Number one, you just obey his commands. And number two, you love other people like he loved you. In fact, 1 John says this is a characteristic of how you'll actually know that you're a believer or not. If you have the ability to love other people like God loved you unconditionally, 1 John 4, 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another the same way. Oh, I like you because... You know, we got a lot in common, so I love you. No, I'm talking about loving people that are unlovable. You know, we had a team just get back from uh, uh, Jordan. We had a team of four people go over there, uh, Phil, Monica, the, the Colin and Andrea, to deliver the shipping container. Remember the shipping container we filled out and sent to Jordan? They go over there with Hannah Massad. You guys have all met Hannah. Hannah, you know what? You know what Han I love Hannah for one reason. All he does is just give himself away. If, if, love, is, if love is giving... What do you have to give away? What do you have? What's the greatest thing you could give back to God? You could just give him back to God as a gift. The only thing you really have to give is your life. I'm just giving this back to you, God. You do whatever you want to with it. Well, I'd like to help the least of mine. It's like this trip we got going down to Morez, you know, we, we, we minister with a guy named Dr. Samaniego. He's gone on, since gone on to be with the Lord. He graduated from medical school and 
and he was living in El Paso. He, you know where he's from? He was from Beverly Hills, California. His goal in life when he got out of medical school was to go back to Beverly Hills, California and just live the high life. But before he went back, when he was a young man, he said, I'm going to give one year of my life to the people in Juarez. And he went and he began to minister in Juarez. We used to go down there. There's a landfill in Juarez. They would fill it over with six foot of sand and sell that land. And the poorest of the poor would come in and buy it, make a little house out of pallets, put a little blue tarp on it. That's where he spent his life to those people till the day he died. Now, why would a guy do that? Because he understood the love of God. And just like God gave it to him, he chose to give it away. And when you begin to live your life like that, the power of God becomes available to you. And you'll experience God do things through you you never could have imagined. And in the process, you'll come to know God by relationship. You'll come to know him in a much greater way. And the result of that is joy on the inner, inner man. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, God. Father, help us to love like you loved us. And Father, even as we close out our service with this last song that Brad and Rebecca are going to do, which is like the perfect song that you just dialed up that I had nothing to do with, I pray that God you speak to us. And, and, and God, that you would empower us this Christmas season to to really give, to give away something that matters to somebody else because that's what you did for us. And that in that process, we might become a little bit more like you, that God gave his son and Jesus gave his life, that we now have the privilege just to give, that you might be glorified in us. I pray you'd help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.